This is Peter O'Rourke with the NAPSIG Foundation. Uh, today is May 27, 2014. We were uh, we are starting our uh, virtual training series on the um, Federal Geospatial Information Infrastructure, and today's trainer will be Lou Summers from the U.S. Department of Homeland Security. Uh, Lou, without further ado, we'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Peter. I appreciate that, and uh, I'd like to uh, welcome everyone uh, to this webinar. Um, I guess it's uh, 1 o'clock in the East Coast and all the folks out West, uh, good morning to you all. Um, what I'm going to talk about today is the GMO, the Geospatial Management Office, uh, the Geospatial Information Infrastructure, the GII. You're going to hear GI quite a bit uh, in this webinar. What I'm going to start off uh, just by giving you a, a quick summary of the agenda items that I, that I want to cover today. The agenda itself looks... Uh, Kind of small, but uh, I tell you, I got a lot of information packed in this presentation. I got about uh, just about 30 slides to go over. Uh, what I'd like to do is just start off by giving you a quick brief background of the Geo Geospatial Management Office, the GMO. Um, then uh, what I'll do is I'll go into more of uh, the GII overview. We'll be talking about some data, some applications and infrastructure within the GII. Uh, and then I'll wrap it up with some GI capabilities and GI access. I will have to say that the GI capabilities, uh, I will go into a little bit of more detail of, of how we do things here, how uh, how we actually use then the um, the applications to access then the, the geospatial data sets. And then last but not least, I think uh, folks on the line will be uh, very interested to know uh, how they would then be able to access this information that I'm going to show today, either uh, from their desktop through their web browser or uh, if they have a UDOP, a user-defined operating picture themselves, uh, that they would like their system to communicate to the GIL. I'll go into uh, details and explaining how uh, that will work. So my first slide here is the Geospatial Management Office, GMO Office. Um, just to kind of give you some background, the GMO was, was established uh, by the Intelligence Reform and Terrorist uh, Prevention Act of 2004. It was implemented through uh, the DHS Management Directive uh, 4030 uh, back in November of uh, 2004. So the GMO's responsibilities really include the following. I'm just going to read this real quick. It's exercise, uh, execute uh, executive leadership in establishing the department's uh, geospatial information and technology programs, directives, initiatives, and standards, techniques, and ensuring that the security of the geospatial data, geographic information system software and hardware, uh, and geospatial applications department-wide. Giving you the structure of the, of the office itself, um, David Alexander is the GMO director. Uh, we report directly, or he reports directly to the DHS CIO, it's the management directive. Uh, for internal and external coordinations, um, we're actually touching a lot of these organizations. Uh, for one, the FGDC, the Federal Geographic Data Committee, um, the, the Open Geospatial uh, Consortium, uh, NEAM, which stands for the National Information Exchange Model. Uh, we have COP, ESC, which is the Executive Steering Committee. Um, I, I'll, I'll just let you read the rest of them there. We've got high field. We're liaisons with S&T, which is mainly uh, sort of the research and development side or arm of DHS, uh, PM, uh, ISE. Really what these all really truly mean is we're really focusing on policy, standards, and architectural interoperability. All right, so the next slide. So, so what is the GII? I mean, when I came here two years ago, um, I understood, uh, based on uh, meeting with David briefly in my interview, what uh, the geospatial itself is a foundational element for situational awareness. Uh, the geospatial capabilities, they play a significant role in incident management. So because of that, then, uh, the GMO itself, through David's uh, hard work, uh, actually stood up what's called then the GII, the Geospatial Information Infrastructure. Uh, provides a technology platform capable of hosting shared geospatial enterprise applications, delivering cost savings through reductions and duplications. So I think of it as really these three key bullets here. It's a collection of enterprise geodata, 
application services and infrastructure support. I'm going to go into a lot more detail of these three things. Let's just start off quickly then on the enterprise geodata itself. I like to think of it these uh, as really as two buckets, the operational data and the foundational data. The operational data, quick uh, definition, think of it as um, the data that's uh, pretty much updated uh, over the course of the year. That's sort of mission critical. The foundational itself is maybe data that's updated only maybe once a year. And I'll give you some examples of that as we move on to the next slide. The application services, uh, that's mainly on the geo-visualization side. Think of like your Bing Maps and your Google Maps. Well, we have uh, simple and secure uh, data viewing uh, tools as well to allow you then to access that operational and foundational data. I'll go into some geocoding services that we, that we have, uh, some batch geocoding, which uh, I hope you're all familiar with. Uh, and also, I'll be talking a little bit more about then uh, the geo uh, content management, uh, more of a collaboration communication type services uh, that we've rolled out within the past year within the GII, uh, again, to allow our analysts to collaborate and communicate this sort of this map centric information amongst each other. And then, last but not least, we're think of it as a, a full fledged infrastructure as a service uh, to DHS. Uh, it's infra infrastructure support to the, the in the uh, the DHS data center. So we're the ones is, that uh, uh, have uh, our, our contract staff down in our DC2 data centers that make sure that uh, that our, our virtual machines are up and running, all the lights are on, and now we're running all the the application services and the data uh, from that infrastructure. So I'd like to think of it as just a one-stop shop. You come in, you don't have to worry about buying any hardware, uh, really buying any software. Uh, we have the data all online. Basically, all you really need is just a, um, a, a web viewer, a browser, and you're able to access then uh, this information. So let's go into a little bit more detail now about the operational foundational data sets. I'm sure uh, everyone's really excited about the data, right? I mean, this is really all about the data, if you think about it. Um, on the left-hand side in the operational uh, data sets, this is all information that we currently have stored within the GII itself. I like to think of it as uh, we have data that's stored within our infrastructure, and also we have access to partner links, which I'll show you later, that are not stored within the GII. So let's start off with the, the operational uh, data links here. First off, we have access, or you would have access to uh, the special event assessment ratings. And uh, what that information really is, uh, we call it SEER data. It's more on the domestic events or special events that, um, that are happening throughout the country, throughout, the, uh, throughout CONUS. Uh, that would be anything from you know, the Super Bowl to, and I know Mike Donnelly, our, um, our data architecture would always say this, to a, pumping, a pumpkin carving festival that could be in Podunk somewhere. So all that information is there. We also have uh, Overseas Personnel Activity Locator, or uh, OPAL, and that is really just listing or, or uh, showing where our uh, resource assets are located throughout the world. Uh, next, we have uh, the COP incident feeds. Uh, these are events of natural disaster or possibly acts of terror terrorism or, or other man-made disasters that the, the NOC, the National Operations Center, is traveling, uh, is tracking to ensure that the, the you know, terrorists or terrorism or the disaster-related information reaches government decision makers. Next, we have the National Biosurveillance Integration System, or C uh, Center, incident feeds. We refer to that to as, as MBIC. They uh, disseminate alerts uh, and pertinent information on biological events of national origin. Uh, next, we have the FEMA, the Integrated Public Alert and Warning System, IPAWS. Uh, that information there is the public alerts and warning systems about serious emergencies. A lot of times you go out there to the GII and you, you bring in this data set, you're going to see point information of, you know, of, of extreme weather events that are happening throughout the country, flooding events, and so on and so forth. 
traffic land information we have. Um, that's uh, mainly all uh, within the COP itself. Uh, it's not within the, uh, the OneView application I'm going to be showing you later on. Again, these are all traffic cameras throughout the country that you're able to click on and, and view the image. Uh, remote sensing imagery information. Uh, again, we're going to be showing, I'll be showing you uh, later on in the, the demonstration how uh, we have access to Bing imagery information. We also have uh, ad hoc um, national special security events, the NSSE. Um, in that case, it could be the Super Bowl or the Jap, uh, Jap, um, Japlin tornado, et cetera. Uh, that is an area in which we can then store this information, this ad hoc information on these special events, and then, of course, um, put those feeds out then to folks who, uh, number one, who are, are accessing the OneView application, or, uh, again, if uh, you have a token, which I'll get into more specifics later, a uh, system-to-system -system connection, you're able then to, uh, uh, to view those, those feeds. On the right-hand side of, the, uh, uh, of this slide itself is the foundational data. Uh, again, we're talking about the HSIP gold and freedom layers. This is information that really gets updated about once a year. Uh, the HSIP, and i got to watch to make sure that I, I explain all the acronyms here. Uh, HSIP stands for Homeland Security Infrastructure Program. Uh, it's made up of, of, of gold and freedom. Uh, right now, the gold layers themselves, the infrastructure is about 568 different layers. I believe it uh, spans across about 26 different themes or layers. Uh, and the other one that we have as well in there is the uh, freedom layers, uh, which are about 357 layers total. The HSIP of freedom is available to both uh, federal, state, local, and tribal governments, uh, industry partners, and their supporting contractors. Uh, and supporting uh, homeland defense, homeland security missions. Um, let me think here. What else do I want to? Uh... Okay. So what I'm going to do then is I'm going to show you some. Um, go to the next slide here. Show you how you can then access some of this documentation. That explains uh, some of the data itself that I just explained. Mainly the HSIP gold and the the HSIP freedom. Uh, if you have access, if you have a, a, a HISN, a Homeland Security Information Network ID, uh, you're able to access then the, um, the Geospatial Resource Community page, uh, which uh, you see here uh, on the, the bottom right side, you'll see documents that are available. Uh, this is information here that will allow you to uh, read up on some metadata information about the HSIP uh, data sets. Um, the, the first two that you see there are um, Excel spreadsheets that list uh, all the different layers and sublayers. I will tell you this, that there is not a data dictionary included with this. I believe that's something that may be coming out uh, in the future. But uh, I'll be showing you later through the, the, the demonstrations here uh, when we log into the GII how you can actually then read uh, you know, about some of the metadata information that makes up the different layers. To access this page, I have the URL there as well. Uh, it's hizen.dhs.gov slash fed slash GIS. And I also give you some information on if you do not have a HISN username and pass, uh, I'll make sure that I explain how you would go about doing that. All right, so I mentioned also that we have data within the GII, or I should say links within the GII, that are just uh, links to partner feeds. Um, in this example that I have to the right here, this is just showing the OneView application. And the map layers itself, or the map layers property dialog there, that just shows you uh, all the different types of layers of partner feeds that we have uh, currently within the GII. Uh, starting off the top, we got North, Northcom, the friendly, uh, the friendly force tracks, uh, the other one that I do not have there is the FAA TFR. It's the temporary flight res, uh, restriction uh, information as well. Uh, next is the USGS hazards information. That's mainly information on earthquakes, hurricanes, volcanoes, and floods. Uh, next, we have the National Inter Interagency Fire Center, the NIFSI wildfires. 
Uh, again, a lot of this stuff, I, I'm not really explaining the actual layers themselves. Um, but anyways, uh, the, the, the theme itself is we have the seven-day fire outlook, fire perimeters, uh, fire watches and warnings, uh, which contain a lot of different layers themselves within each of the services. Uh, Red Cross information on 17 layers total. That comes from the National uh, Shelter System. Uh, that has information that uh, basically on, sh on shelter locations, open and closed shelters, uh, shelters that are full, uh, and so on and so forth. Like I said, there's like 17 different layers there. And then finally, we just have the, uh, the NOAA uh, NALCAS watches, warnings and advisories. And uh, uh, last one we have there is uh, FEMA, FEMA flood boundaries. So it's a lot of information that's contained within the GII. And what we also like to do here within, within the GMO is also kind of track uh, what layers, what eight SIP layers uh, are, are being hit within the GII. I mean, metrics are important to understand, you know, what is being used and what's not being used. Um, these metrics just show really the hits on the eight SIP layers. Uh, I think on the left-hand side, hopefully you can all see that uh, I'm listing the top 20 sub layers. Uh, for just the past year, uh, it's just over 400,000 on the specific layer of, bound, of U.S. state boundaries. So somebody's out there downloading a lot or, or accessing a lot of U.S. state boundary information. And then on the right-hand side, it kind of shows in the top 10 layer usages from the same time frame. Uh, that would be May of, of 2013, May 2014. Again, this is mainly looking at the theme itself, the boundaries theme. Uh, and again, you can see the, 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 uh, the top 10. Usually when I run these reports, I'm always going to see, it always seems that uh, energy is always up there, um, public venues is always up there, law enforcement information is always up there. I can tell you that uh, you know, adding up the total number of hits within the GI over the last year was right around almost 3.2 million hits on all these different services. So uh, it is being used, and possibly after this webinar series here, uh, you all be contacting the GMO as well to grant uh, uh, get access as well yourself. All right, so I'm going to shift gears a little bit and talk more about the GI capabilities, mainly from an application standpoint, and then how from these applications you can simply uh, access then the, the services, the data services I just talked about. So first off, uh, the GI capabilities, first and foremost, um, access to the data itself. We also give you capabilities within the GI to discover and upload content information as well. We have simple mapping tools within the GII uh, that will allow you to search, discover, and then, of course, display the geospatial data. We give you options and ability to share maps and apps with, with others. And this ultimately allows you to communicate and collaborate uh, better amongst yourself, amongst the analysts. So the idea really is here, you come into the GII, uh, we have all this data, of course, that uh, is at your fingertips. We allow you to search for information. You find that information. Once it's found, you can open it up. You can either view it in a mapping tool, or, of course, you can read some metadata about that. Once you do make that map, you're able then to mash up that information with additional information that may be pertinent to your, your mission. You can simply then save that. When you save that information, you can share that with others. So basically what you're doing is you could be creating a template then for others then to mash up other data sets. So let's go through now and let's see how this all really truly works. So before I even get started, and, and, and again, all the slides that I'm showing you here uh, are actual things that, that I've gone through within the GI uh, to, to make these slides. So uh, you know, depending on time at the end, uh, because we do, we, we have a bunch of slides here. I can actually go in and really show a live demo as well to make sure that you all understand that it really does exist. But in order to do so, I mean, the first time in, uh, you're going to go out to gii.dhs.gov. Uh, we use HISN, the Homeland Security Information uh, Network, as our identity 
uh, provider or our, our identity source uh, to allow then users to log into the GII. So why I'm showing you this, uh, folks out there who do have HISN accounts, you're probably very familiar with this. The first time you log in, you're going to see the login to, to the OneView application. You're going to type in your username and password. Uh, then once you hit the login button, you're going to see a second. It's a two-factor authentication. You're going to see the confirm your identity page uh, pop up. It's going to send you basically an email with a seven-digit code. You're going to cut and paste that code into the inner passcode. And at the bottom, you can actually check the little box there to, uh, to have this code active for the next 12 hours. So the next time that you log into the GII, you wouldn't see this second page that's confirm your identity. You just see the first page, your, uh, your username and password. This was implemented, uh, I believe, September of last year, 2013, when Hizen went to uh, Hizen R3. So once we've gone through that login, this is the landing page of the GII. Um, and uh, what I'm going to do, uh, the remainder then of this webinar, is I'm actually going to go through then each of the little uh, links and buttons and, and menus here just to kind of give you all an idea of, of all the different capabilities that, that the GII has to offer. Sort of cradle to grave where we've kind of you know, searched for some information, uh, we've created a map or we looked at a map, we then saved that map and then we shared that with others. I'm going to kind of go through that whole process with you. But, but uh, what I really want to kind of start off with is really about in the middle of the page there under apps uh, and services. We have some buttons there um, that I want to go over real quick. Uh, the first one is the OneView application itself, which uh, I'm pretty sure you've, you folks on the line may have heard this before and you probably access it. This is our real simple lightweight viewing tool, uh, or one of them, uh, that's built on the ArcGIS Silverlight API. Um, let me go to the next page so you can get us a look and feel of it. Uh, it's a real simple, lightweight uh, data viewer, as I said. It's kind of it's secure behind HISM. Uh, at the top, you will notice you will see road, uh, aerial, aerials with uh, labels that allow you to toggle between um, you know, the aerial views and the map view. Just very similar to like uh, the Bing Maps uh, in uh, Google or Google Maps. Uh, the one below that called layer, when the user clicks on that, uh, basically what you see here that I've highlighted is, um, is what you're going to see uh, when you click on that properties layer. You're going to see map layers at the top. I just want to go through that real quick. Um, the first button that you see there is the little globe that says ESRI. That's if you want to add additional REST services uh, to the, the, the OneView application itself. And so on forth, so down the line, if you have a KML, KMZ file that you want to add, you can click on that. You will then allow, the system will allow you to browse to that file uh, and then bring it into your session. Uh, the next one is a WMS, a, a web map service, an OGC standard uh, service. The next is a GRSS. If you have some syndicated feed out there, uh, you can connect to that as well. The next one, the little X, that's um, if you want to do some geocoding itself, uh, you're able then to, um, you know, fill in the the, the dialogue that that, uh, that comes that we have here that that, uh, um, that comes with the geocoding service. You're able to browse to the file itself that you have on your desktop, and actually geocode or batch geocode within the application. And then finally, we just have the legend. You can toggle the legend on and off. Coming down to the next tier then, we're looking at DHS partner and operational data feeds, uh, stuff that I just kind of already have given you a heads up on, uh, explained. Um, again, with these little pull down menus, you can click on, say, the uh, FEMA iPause alerts, and underneath that you will actually see three layers that you're able to bring in, points, lines, and polygons of those alerts. And then down at the bottom, again, we have the DHS foundational data. That's your, again, your 2013 Homeland Security Infrastructure Program data. Again, that's both HSIP, Gold, and Freedom. That's access to all the 568 layers total. 
So going back up then to the menu, uh, the next that we have next to the layer button is the query menu. Uh, that just simply allows the user uh, to uh, create an envelope or a, say a polygon or a square or, or a, a radius uh, and select each of those points that fall within that, uh, that selected uh, polygon. The CONUS button itself will allow you to zoom all the way out to CONUS. And of course, the Find button at the end will allow you then to either find an address or zoom into a particular city. Coming down under the S for South, uh, we have um, the next button itself, um, which is, let me make sure I got my, my uh, spot here. That's the address from point. So what you can do is if you're zoomed into a particular area, you click on that button and you, you take your little mouse or cursor and you can click it on a street to actually get the street uh, address. The next one, the little pin, is the draw graphics feature. I think that's pretty self-explanatory. You can draw graphics and annotate them uh, as well on the, the map. The next that we have is the measure length. That's in either feet, miles, or yards, uh, acreage, uh, etc. Uh, and then finally, it's the little car there. We have directions. That's just simply getting uh, from and to direction. We have copy URL. Again, that's just if you, it's not really saving the full URL, but saving the map extent uh, of the view that you're, that you're viewing uh, currently. Uh, it will save that extent, and you can send that URL to someone else uh, easily in an in a email message. And when they click on that, uh, it's going to zoom into that particular area. Now, mind you, that person that you're sharing that with has to have uh, a his and ID and pass as well. Uh, we have options link there and also a print link. So uh, you can get your map all prettied up and hit the print button, uh, and then you'll have a dialog there that uh, will allow you then to uh, create the map of your viewing pleasure there. All right, so let's go to the next slide then. Let's go to the geocoding service. This would be the next, and I have it highlighted up there in red, the little red box around uh, geocoding. That would be the next button to click on, on from the landing page. Again, this is, uh, allows you to do some batch geocoding. Uh, from this page, of course, you can type in a name of, of the job itself, just like I have here in this example. Uh, when you hit the browse, you're actually able to browse then your desktop for the file itself and then you're going to submit the job. At first, uh, in this case, it's called test. The little uh, status dot there will be yellow, meaning that it is actually performing the geocode. Uh, it could take anywhere from you know, several seconds, a minute, to up to 24 hours uh, in, in able for, uh, to, uh, to complete this geocoding process. Once it is completed, uh, the little dot turns green, and you're then able then to uh, download that information on Excel uh, file spreadsheet. Uh, again, just on the left-hand side, it is secure uh, geocoding through the HISN credentials. It's users are logging in with your HISN credentials to actually do this. Uh, it supports uh, Excel spreadsheets and also, of course, uh, comma delimited files. Uh, once it's completed, of course, you're going to be able to download that new coordinate. Now I have an, another slide here of, uh, I think maybe a couple other slides to, to kind of show you what the results look like. Um, also, I wanted to mention as well, so there's two ways in which to geocode. The first one at the top is actually the batch geocode that we have. Uh, the, the one on the bottom, the, uh, the select columns for geocoding, the column selection for geocoding, um, that's actually within the OneView application itself, so it kind of gives you two options here, and they're both uh, really the, the same geocoder. Okay, so let's talk about the geocoding uh, services continued here. Uh, what the file actually should look like when you upload or before you upload, there are five uh, columns uh, at minimum that you have to include in your geocoding file. And I have them listed here as an ID, which is it's a simple uh, 1 through X number. Um, then I have uh, city, state, uh, and zip code. Those are the five minimum columns that you have to have. And then, of course, everything after that, after the zip code, is all the attribute information that's going to describe then that point location. So you may have in there, uh, if it's describing a building, it may be, 
you know, the, the facade of the house, the color of the house, those other attribute types describe that point location. And then the results that come back after you, uh, you geocode. Of course, it's going to contain all the information that you originally had in the file itself. Plus, it's going to have these other five uh, columns included in the, in, the, uh, in the spreadsheet. We have the interpolated lat long file, or lat long columns. Uh, they basically just denote uh, the location at the street level. Uh, and then there's also a lat long for rooftop. And then finally, there is another column called confidence that will give you a high, medium, low. It's sort of like the confidence of the, of uh, sort of from the candidate list of of how confident, again, um, you know, that interpolation method actually worked for you. Okay. Let's just talk real quick about um, the HSIP freedom layers. That's the uh, the other little button that's that's within the applications and services area uh, from the landing page. Again, when the user clicks on that, it will actually take you then to the geo database files that we have stored in the GII that allow folks then to to download. I believe there's about 26 of them here. Uh, this contains again about 357 total layers. Uh, that, that state and local folks are actually uh, allowed to, to download for free. Again, these are folks that have, again, a homeland security, homeland defense type mission. Um, for instance, if you click on the agriculture, it's going to actually download then uh, that as a geodatabase file. And again, you're not going to have the full complement information in there as that we have in gold. And, and I don't have the specific numbers. Again, we could probably go back to uh, the, the, the documentation that I had on the, uh, the GIS COI uh, and get that information. If we have uh, time at the end, uh, maybe I can just show you an example of what that spreadsheet looks like and what the contents of it is. But again, these are downloadable uh, to your desktop, and then from, at that point, uh, you're free to use them then uh, within your own environment. Uh, moving over to the middle of the landing page, we have coordinated uh, coordination uh, resources. Um, the one I really want to highlight here and just give uh, props to real quick because uh, Mr. David Lilly will be giving um, a webinar uh, next week, I believe. I think it might be next uh, next Tuesday or next Wednesday. I'm sorry I don't have the, the, the date here in front of me. Oh, no, I'm sorry. It's right there in front of me. It's an haptic presentation on Wednesday, June 4th. Uh, he's going to be talking about uh, the GeoConOps, and the GeoConOps describes the geospatial resources and activities uh, supporting homeland security operations uh, and the uh, emergency management functions. Um, the GeoConOps really include, uh, I guess you want to think of it as a community uh, analysis model. It's the current resources and capabilities such as you know, personnel assets and analytical models. It also contains best practices, requirements, and activities. Uh, for disaster response missions. Um, federated operations centers, uh, we talked about, uh, talks about detailed scenarios of uh, uh, response activities for a catastrophic natural event. And again, David will, will, will kind of hit on all these next week. And, and last but not least, I can't, I can't forget the, uh, the authoritative uh, data itself, which is, uh, it's, it's famous within the GeoConOp. It's, uh, Appendix B, which uh, describes the authoritative data metric, uh, consisting of, of many, many links. Uh, we're talking thousands of, of, um, of layers that have been identified out there uh, for uh, either you know, to, to, to download or, or to mash up within uh, your, your maps uh, moving forward based on your mission. All right. GI resources and user's guide. On the far right-hand side, then, the middle of the page, um, we have uh, areas in which, you know, first-time users can go in and download, uh, again, as I mentioned uh, briefly, the, the HSIP Golden Freedom documentation. Uh, there are some other GII documents there. We have a user guide. Again, it will help uh, folks sort of navigate the, the graphical user interface moving forward. We have a one how-to video there. Uh, one of our uh, support uh, analysts 
uh, has actually uh, made a little uh, video, again, navigating the, the, the GUI itself. Um, so I want to say about that. We, we, we do or we will be having or we will have more information there as we mature out the GI moving forward. And that may be more, um, maybe more specific user guide type information on how to um, moving forward in the future. So now what I'm going to do is kind of switch gears and move to the top of the GII uh, landing page. We're going to start with the, the gallery page. Again, the gallery is a place in which to browse uh, feature maps, web maps that have been created in-house. Again, uh, these six pages, and I'm not going to leaf through all of them, uh, is information that the GMO has already posted uh, within the GII. So think of these as uh, already ready-made web maps, um, you know, based uh, template types that, uh, for instance, if, if you're looking for some agricultural information, uh, you're able to, um, you know, select that. Uh, open it in, the, in a map itself and then use that as your template moving forward to mash up additional information. And what I have here is I have um, an example that I'm going to run through real quick where, uh, you know, I, I do have or I, I am interested in some DHS IAL information. That is Infrastructure Assets List from uh, HSIP Gold. So what I was able to do was hover my brow or my, my cursor over top of the details link that I have there chosen in red. When I click on that, I'm going to be able then to uh, view this page that you see here, which uh, has a, a brief description, and all the layers that are contained within that web map. What I'm not showing here is, is their, their hypertext links as well, where I can click on, say, you know, the agricultural and food layer. Uh, and then read additional information or get additional information about that layer itself. Again, it's not a data dictionary, but it is a pretty in-depth, uh, detailed information on all the fields that are contained within that, that, uh, that layer. If I go ahead and if I click Open, it's going to automatically open the map within the GII itself. So basically what you're able to do then at that point is toggle at the top between details, uh, add information, and base layer. If you click on base, uh, what's going to happen is it looks like ArcGIS Online. Uh, well, actually, it, it, it really is ArcGIS Online, but uh, it's really not on-premise. And I should tell you that uh, what you are actually looking at as far as the technology is concerned is, is portal, uh, ArcGIS portal. So that's what we're really using is... Um, very, very similar ArcGIS Online, as you're probably all uh, aware, and you probably, most of you probably figured it out as you're looking at this. Uh, but but the, the difference really is is, is everything is run uh, behind our firewall, DHS. So, again, getting back then to uh, the map itself. In this example, I here have uh, all the infrastructure assets list uh, within this web map. Um, I'm able to hover my mouse over top of a point, and I can click on it, and I can get some additional information on that. I can also um, add information to it as well, where I'm mashing up now information I either have on my desktop, or I may be going out to the web to grab some information, or I may be wanting to create a graphic as well within the map and share with folks. So again, I'm just showing you the, the three different types uh, here that allows you to, the first one, creating an, an edible layer. It's basically just creating a, a graphic. Uh, we can also add a layer from file if you have something uh, like a point layer that you have stored uh, on your desktop. You can bring that in and mash that up with this, uh, with this web map. Or if you know of some other public information that's out there and you have the URL, uh, again, you can just navigate by uh, clicking the ArcGIS server and web service, uh, and then, of course, uh, cut and pasting the URL there and, and add the layer then to the table of contents. The beauty of that then, once you get to that point and you mashed up a lot of that, that information, you can then save and share that information as well uh, with other users within the GII. Uh, the first one just shows you uh, the dialogue of, of saving the map itself. You're going to give it a title, of course, 
uh, this this case, I just I'm zoomed into the Washington D.C. area, so I'm just calling it uh, DHS IAL Washington D.C. Let's give it some tag information. That information is important for uh, future search and discovery. If I uh, I'll show you, I think uh, later on in this uh, demo that. Um, if I have it tagged as infrastructure and assets, if I go to the gallery area and I um, do a search for, say, assets or infrastructure, it should find in those tags and then discover this web map that I just created. Um, the bottom dialog, it's showing a share. So uh, once it is saved, I'm able then to share this information. I can share it with... Uh, in this case, the public or, or everyone. And uh, something else that that, uh, uh, that we're looking at as we mature out the GII, uh, and that is um, creating groups as well, which you can then share this information within your particular uh, group that you're part of. So if I share this with everyone, Anyone and everyone who has a his and ID can come into the GII, search for that information. Once they discover it, they can then, of course, view it. Okay. So, I, again, I, I kind of jumped over the, the, the groups portion. As I said, we are um, trying to mature that out. We are currently moving, uh, and it's going to be tomorrow evening, uh, from a GI, uh, ArcGIS Portal 2X version to 10.2.2. .2. And we wanted to really hold that off by creating these groups until we did uh, get to uh, a more, uh, a newer version of, of Portal, only because we didn't want to have a lot of groups out there, have them create a lot of content, and then have us try to move all that information over because, again, we were, we were running on uh, an older version uh, and there was going to be a lot of manual work there in, in, in order to, to make that happen. So we tried to hold off a lot of folks creating their groups until hopefully uh, starting on Wednesday or Thursday uh, to create groups and, of course, share that information amongst the groups. So I'm going to just go right to my content. And under my content, uh, we have some information here that uh, is information, again, that the user themselves, in my case, Lou Summers, uh, have either created within Portal or within the GII uh, or have uploaded content within the GII. Um, what I have here is uh, two examples. Of course, the one I just created uh, through the demonstration, the, the DHS IAL um, uh, Washington map. Uh, and also I have some information in there already that I uploaded a power outage shapefile. So again, even though it says it's a shapefile, it's, it's really a zipped, compressed shapefile, which you all have to zip them first before they can be uploaded. The other thing that you can't do at this point is you cannot mash that shapefile up uh, within your web maps. It's right now just content that's been uploaded that's when it's discovered, it can then be then downloaded basically and then unzipped and then you can use that then on, on your end. What also I have here uh, that I didn't go into full detail is um, the actual service itself, the web map service that I created uh, at the bottom here, uh, you can add some slick JPEG information to sort of describe that. I've uh, gone out to the web and I found uh, this pretty picture of uh, the monuments here that I was able to download, store it locally on my, my desktop, and then bring that thumbnail in to represent that uh, that map service that I created. Again, I can go in there and I can uh, edit that information by adding more tags if I need to. I can also add a lot more metadata information uh, as well uh, going forward. So once I've shared that information now or that web map with everyone, coming back to the landing page under trending topics, you'll now see uh, the DHS IAL uh, web map, the uh, the infrastructure asset list that I just created. Again, I have a new user coming into the GII or, you know, an, an analyst who is interested in uh, uh, infrastructure asset information, maybe of the Washington, D.C. area. Uh, they can search and discover this. They can then open this information. They can then mash up additional information 
uh, from their own their own content, their own uh, desktop, and then resave that out back to the GII. So you can see how you're sort of communicating, collaborating now within the GII itself, sharing of information, adding uh, additional value added to the web maps. Let's talk about federated search capabilities within the GII. Um, we've been working with Jerry Johnson and the Department of, of Interior uh, by creating a search capability within the GII uh, that allows our users uh, to go ahead and search for content both within the GII and also outside the GII within the GEO platform. So think of, of, of um, and David Alexander um, preaches this as well, that uh, all the SBU information uh, will be contained within the GII, and of course then all public information uh, can then be discovered within the GEO platform. So even information in the future that we have in the GII that we designate or uh, tag as public information, it could be pushed in the future then to the GEO platform. So let's, let me give you a flavor of then what that search would look like. So say I'm in the gallery page. I can type in the keyword in the upper right hand corner of infrastructure. Uh, and then what's going to happen is I'll get a series of, of, of hits that will come back that you see here uh, within the body then of, 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 this, uh, of this page where you can see uh, GI portal and then you can also see on the banner the geospatial platform CCAM. These are the results of the, sh of the searches that came back with the keyword term of infrastructure. I also have ways in which to filter that information as well because initially when you create the search, a little dialog box will pop up just telling you, hey, you know, you're going to be getting back uh, 100 or more results. And you know if you're going out and you've done any kind of Google search, you know, that's they're, they're just kind of really hard to... Um, you know, to, to search all that information. So we've given um, um, some options here in which you can select the different catalogs. So by default, um, you can see here in this, uh, in this page, uh, on this slide, that I have a GI portal, I got the geospatial platform, and also the FEMA geospatial platform. So I'm really searching three different platforms here. Uh, I can, of course, toggle those on and off to only then select then say GII portal or turn GII portal off and FEMA off and only search then the public catalog in the GEO platform. On the right hand side then uh, I have different item types that I can search on as well. Um, web maps, I got uh, map services, KML services, and WMS services. So if I'm only interested in just bringing over WMS, I'm going to turn off those other three and it's only going to bring over those WMS services. What I can tell you now that, uh, and again, we're, we're maturing this out as we go, um, and we just uh, really launched this uh, within the last two months, um, that if it is a search, of, a search comes back with uh, information from within the GII, um, you can pretty much open that up within the map viewer itself uh, and, and, and view that information. Other data that comes back or, or search results that come back from either FEMA or the geospatial platform, uh, it's unfortunate at this point that you cannot open that up or mash that up with, uh, within the GII um, layers itself. You have to actually literally go out and grab the URL itself and cut and paste it into your map viewer as I showed you before where you can add layer within the map viewer and then of course add a web map or a URL at that point. So you have to, so, so as we mature the GII out, um, those capabilities, of course, uh, will become uh, available to make it a lot easier then for the user to not only discover, uh, search and discover, but also be able to mash up uh, moving forward. All right, so I'm getting down to, I guess, to my last couple slides here. Um, this is very, very important, and, and um, hopefully we'll get some, some questions about this uh, when I'm done here as well. Um, this slide actually kind of shows, uh, uh, explains then how to access the GII. Really, there are two ways in which to uh, access then the, the services. 
Uh, one is through a GII secure token. That's more of a system-to-system -system connection or handshake. I mentioned before, if you have your own UDOP or your, your own user-defined operating picture, or you may have an ESRI Flex Viewer, or you may have a Silverlight application, whatever that may be, um, what we were able to do is uh, we're able to cut you a token, a GII token, and then, of course, supply you then with all the, the URLs to access then uh, those GII backend services. By then appending that token to the end of the, of the URL, you're able then to, from system to system, connect then to those GII services. I have some information on that as well, a document that I can share with the folks then uh, after we're done here. Uh, and, of course, then the, the other way in which to access uh, the GII is through uh, our identity provider, our identity management provider, which is HISM, the Homeland Security Information Network. Um, you can just simply uh, send uh, the GMO a message, uh, gmo at dhs.gov, uh, stating who you are, uh, what you need access to the GIS uh, COI community of interest. Uh, and then what we'll do is uh, we then can grant you or nominate you for a his and ID and pass. What will happen then is once you're nominated, you'll receive information back from his and it's very important that I tell you that because they're asking for additional information from you all. So it's just not when, when you send us a message, you're gonna get um, a, a his and name and password back. You're gonna get some information from his and uh, that you'll need to fill out and get that back to them. Once that information is then back to them, I'm able to go back into our COI uh, and, and validate you. At that point, then, you will receive another message uh, stating your user ID and, and, and pass and go from there. Once you uh, have your HISN ID, uh, you're going to log in to uh, the GAI.DHS.gov, and you're going to go your merry way just from, the, uh, from the, the, the slides that I just showed here. You can also go to HISN.DHS.gov uh, slash uh, fed slash GIS, and that's going to get you into the His and SharePoint GIS community of interest. And that information there, you'll be able to launch the GII from there as well. And, of course, get uh, a lot of that documentation information that, uh, that I flashed up there on the screen for you as well and on, on all the, uh, the HSIP Gold and Freedom uh, documentation. So that really sort of concludes uh, what I wanted to kind of share with you all. Um, Peter, are you are you there? Yeah, I'm not I am. sure. I'm not sure how I'm doing on time here. Uh, we have some time. Uh, we do have a few questions. Um, uh, one was, can you just go back and show the, the real quick one? Show the last website that you mentioned. Um, I guess that would be. Uh, was it the GII or was it the HISN? Uh, I presume uh, it's the HISN one. It wasn't the last one you're talking about. I presume it was the HISN one. Okay. okay. Yeah, well, so... If, if you keep that up, that's fine. Um, there are a couple comments. Um, one comment is GII is covered in the FEMA um, EMI online course number IS0063 um, for those of you who uh, want more information. Um, that's, that's Point. That's a real good point. Thanks for pointing that out. Yes. I can share that link with folks as well. Okay, There's good. also uh, some okay. training on ConOps, GeoConOps there as well. Yeah, that, that was done that as well. Um, uh, one question then, uh, d how does a company obtain a, and I'm assuming we we're talking about a private company, not like a fire company, but how does a company obtain a GII secure token? Or I guess a better question would be, can a company obtain a GII secure token? Yeah, well, first of all, you know, if you, you have to have a homeland security mission, right? So you're supporting, say, uh, you're a contractor and you're supporting, um, you know, that, that homeland security, homeland defense mission. Uh, what we would do is we would have or we would contact that government point of contact. That person then would become really uh, the point of contact then to, uh, um, you know, request that, that token. And then that token then would be shared then with that support contract, contract staff, and they can go from there. 
And okay, albeit, so you know, it'd be used then for it would be used then for, of course, that that mission as well. Yeah. Okay, uh, again, so if you're a contractor supporting, uh, you know, another mission, you, you're you're just you just want to his an ID and pass. Uh, we can do that as well. Okay, great. Um, another question would be, and I guess this is somewhat similar, um, but is there a group? Is there an ability to do a group Hizen account? And I and I think it might not. I think that might be a bit of a, a misleading question. But is there a way to do a Hizen account where multiple people can access the same map at the same time, work on the same map at the same time? Well, well, yeah. What you can do is, I mean, everyone has to have their own unique Hizen ID and pass. So there's not a a, a group. The way I, I interpret the, the question the first time around, it's not just one generic HISN uh, login ID and pass that uh, everyone can use. So each individual would have to have their own, uh, you know, HISN ID and pass. But each of those individual uh, individuals can actually go into the GI and create a map, right? And once that map is created, that's, think of that as like the map template. Other, others within the same organization then can come in and and adopt that template and then add additional information uh going forward. Resave that map and share that out with everyone as well. Okay, great. Um another question is uh is the NavTech um state release transportation data included in the H of gold, which I believe the answer is yes. And then yes, is there is. any restriction are there any restrictions um on how that data can be used because I think uh the question is, is basically being asked: If you get that that H gold data from NGA, there are some restrictions on how you can use it. That 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 is correct, and and I don't have like all the restrictions here in front of me, but yeah, the the uh, that's definitely um, you know a, a Fed Homeland Security Homeland Defense mission uh, can access that information, right? Um, if it's a state official or a state um, if the if the if the the H of gold data is released into a state, of course they have to be under some kind of, you know, federal presidential declared emergency. And of course that information then can only be used for that specific mission or that that specific event. So if a state is actually um, you know granted permission to use that information, uh, say maybe in the state of Cal uh, California or Colorado and wildfires. Uh, that data can only be used during or during that time, and those derivative products can only be made uh, for uh, during that time. But of course, after that event, uh, that data then cannot be used. Okay. Uh, and then, similar, somewhat similar question is: Are local governments able to access the H of Freedom? Um, That's correct. They can. Yeah. They sure can. Uh, and then, what what is the turnaround time to get an, a HISN account for a local fire agency? Well, that's a really good question. Like I said, if you send uh, the the uh, the GMO, and I have it up here, uh, contact GMO at dhs.gov. Again, with your name, your organization, uh, your email address, your phone number. Um, what we can do then is we can nominate you. And like I said, once you're nominated, uh, HISM will then send uh, you some information that you have to fill out and send back to HISM. And at that point, we can then uh, validate you within the GIS COI. So once that's Great. completed, I've had folks uh, as short as just a couple of days turnaround to get their uh, their his and ID and pass. But again, it's all going to be determined on how quickly the user on the other end can get that information filled out and sent back. Okay. And then to that point, um, you know, Matt, who asked the question, if you need help on, on that, just contact me as well, and we can work with, with uh, the DHS yep. folks. Um, some folks at Highfield asked me to pass along that there's, uh, in terms of getting access to um, HSIP related questions, both HSIP Gold and HSIP Freedom, uh, you can go to the Highfield Working Group's website, which is H I F L D. WG.org, um, and you can uh, get access on some of the HSIP questions there. Um, I have a, a fairly open-ended question for you, um, Lou, uh, and, and this might be a right. tough one, but uh, how does this uh, GII um, and, and all of the um, other issues that you've raised today, how do they relate to virtual USA? 
Uh, well, Virtual USA is its own uh, UDOP, right? But but the, the thing of it is, um, uh, think how I can answer this. Um, I I. I I'm not sure that I could really answer that, Peter. I'm sorry to say. I, I think I think that's a fine answer. It's a it's a tough question, um, because it, I I know you don't work on the virtual USA effort. Um, Don, if you have more specific questions on that, I, I did want to at least pose it to uh Lou. Sure. If you want to get into some details on that, give me give me a call. We can try to get some And answers. and what I can do too is I can try to provide maybe uh some information as well on my end and send it to you that you could possibly share out with folks as well. Okay. Um, there's a comment, a follow-up question on the HSIP Freedom and Gold, um, and I want to yes. make sure I'm, we're being clear on one thing. In the in the context of um, of, of with, within the GII, uh, am I correct that you can access HSIP Freedom and Gold layers within the GII absent a presidentially declared disaster? That that is correct. That is correct. And so then, if you're a state and local user and you have a HISN ID and pass, yes, you can either use OneView or GI Portal to display those HSIP Freedom and Gold layers. But you can't download them. You, well, you can't download the gold. You can download the freedom, but not the gold. Okay. And then so the the, the, the question regarding the, – the question was, was – it was more of a comment, and, and, and I just want to make sure that our audience understands that we, we fully agree, and, and I believe a lot within the federal government, a lot of folks within the federal government agree um, with this comment, is if the data can only be used during a declared event, then time can be lost while trying to get and find the right data. And, and that's something that we have um, expressed to both NGA and DHS many times is, the, the worst time to give anyone any sort of data is right before an event or during an event. Um, and and that, that message is well received. Part of the problem is, is really based on how license agreements have been created. Um, I, I, will, I will offer up, I'm sure I'm not supposed to, but I'll offer up one loophole for anyone who might want to find some HSIP gold data. Um, if your state has an open presidentially declared disaster, you are able to access that HSIP gold data and request that data um, through NGA, through the High Field Working Group. Um, no. You can put a request in for that HSIP gold data to work on that particular presidentially declared disaster, but you are able then to get access to the actual CDs that contain those data sets if your state has a disaster that has still on the books, and believe it or not, almost every state has a disaster still on the books. Gotcha. All right, let me okay. see if there's any more questions, a technical question. Um, all right, I'm just going to read this. I haven't prefaced it, previewed it yet, so it's a long one. I like that ARC Explorer has been added, but did GII move from Palantara X3 to the current OneView system? Also, GEO MAC info seems to be blocked when trying to access it through OneView. Um, how about we gotcha. go with those two first? Yeah, well, uh, it was before my time, but yeah, the old ICAS system, I guess, was uh, replaced by uh, with OneView, right, mm -hmm. as our simple uh, data viewing tool. Again, it's built. It's it's based off of the. ArcGIS Silverlight a API. I think it's version 3.1 or 3.2. It's 3x, put it that way. Um, and uh, for the, the second question, or second part of the question, um, that NIFSI, I think it was the, the wildfire coverage, um, that's coming from a partner feed. So we have a mechanism built into the OneView application that if that link has been severed, uh, it will tell you a, a little uh, dialogue will pop up saying that you know there's something wrong with that link. We wanted to put that in there because we were getting a lot of uh, questions back of why why can't I access inf this information within the GII? And really, it wasn't data that's in the GII. It's just a link to another partner. And for whatever reason, that partner feed may be down. So the only thing I could okay. tell folks when they come across that is to keep trying. Uh, we also sometimes uh, are, are uh, in communications 
uh, with our partners to let them know that as well, that their feeds are down. Uh, sometimes they don't know it as well, so we kind of maybe give them a little nudge sometimes. And other times uh, it may be down just temporarily for, you know, what other uh, information or whatever things that they may be doing, like maybe a, an update or something like that, uh, a patch update on their end. Okay. Um, two two last questions, and then and then we'll end because we are a bit over time. Um, first is, what is the status of DHS Earth? Oh, that's a really good question. Yep. Is that just that one question? Yeah, and then I'll ask the the second one's an easy one. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, what we're doing right now is we're working with our our uh, GI support staff in house here uh, to get. Uh, DHS Earth back up and running again. That was broken or severed during the uh, uh, September of last year when we moved over to R3, his and R3 with the two-factor authentication. We're now looking at, we're, we're taking baby steps when we do this. We're looking at uh, DHS uh, PIV users uh, where uh, we're going to be able to authenticate through your PIV ID uh, at first and then of course later we'll be uh, bringing in all others as well, all your other his and users or non-DHS uh, PIV users. Uh, we're looking, you know, sometime down the road here in the near future. Um, I know I talked with David Alexander earlier about that. Um, we just want to kind of dangle the carrot out there that is coming soon. I just don't have a, a, a date yet. We are working with, uh, you know, our support folks here in-house in and also uh, Google techies as well uh, to get this thing fixed. We're also looking um, along the same lines uh, as to get the ArcGIS desktop users uh, back online as well. So an analyst sitting at their desk uh, who is a hardcore GISer uh, can also use their PIV to access the GII services, to, again, to mash that up within their desktop. And in the future, we would love to be able, as we mature this thing out, uh, be able to allow the desktop users then um, to access the GII and then upload their web maps into the GII and share that as well. So that's where the Great. analyses are all done on the on the desktop side, you know, the hardcore overlay, buffer, erase, clip, whatever, uh, and then be able to take uh, those services or, or those maps and create a service from that as well within the GII. Great, thanks, Lou. And then the last simple question is. Um, is this presentation, or can you get us a, a scrubbed presentation that um, would be available that we can include with the download of this recording? Um, would you be able to provide that to folks? Uh, there's some interest in some of the websites and other information you showed. Sure. Okay. Yep, I sure so that, that might slightly delay my ability to post uh, the download on the website, but we'll, we'll shoot for it being up tomorrow at some point, just as soon as we get this PowerPoint from Lou. Gotcha. Okay, so look, that being said, uh, Lou, I want to thank you very much for taking the time to put this to, uh, put this um, uh, presentation together and sharing it with us. Um, please extend our thanks to David Alexander for all the great work that he does. Um, and I'd like to most importantly say thank you to everybody uh, on the call who participated. I know it's Memorial Weekend. Um, I'm sure many of you are fresh off the beach, um, but we really thank you for taking the time and um, spending the past hour with us and going over this. And as always, please feel free to call me or email me if you have any questions about today's event or any future or past events. Um, thank you very much, and this will end the recording. And thank you.